Howdy folks, this is Revel Keats Ross, and you are listening to Prag Magic. I know it's been a little while since the last podcast, but uh, been quite busy. Um, those of you that subscribe to the Patreon at patreon.com slash pragmagic know that we just had a crazy month of launching our somatic magics, our handcrafted, handmade zines, and my personal talismanic workings through the cassette medium. These are all handcrafted and personalized. If you want to learn more, please subscribe to patreon.com slash pragmagic, where you can also find tiers to receive a brand new hex cassette from either Hauntomancer or some Audiomancy workings that I've done, or maybe even the last Dim Zoom album, or the new Rebel Roz record that I've been working on in cassette form every two months. Um, it's been a blast. Everyone from Sweden to Scotland uh, to the good old US of A had received their packages. Granted, I think they received them right around November 5th, and well, we all know what happened that fateful day here in America. But without further ado, I just wanted to say how grateful I am to have had good friend, troubadour, and brilliant writer Gabriel Hart on for this episode. It was a really poignant episode and a prescient one, one of the time, one that I needed personally, uh, because Gabriel had just finished his new book, On High at Red Tide. It's his debut novel, and we talk about the process of churning and chewing through a major work that has taken him years about the accessibility of the past after some wisdom and after some hexorcisms of working through your own personal lore and your own personal kind of narrative. And we talk about ex-hexing the self-imposed writer dilemmas such as deadlines and letting the art speak for itself trying not to rush anything and well he's done incredible work you should check out beyond the last estate it's his new rag um, his literary rag it's incredible you can find all of his links in the show notes below i personally am off on a sabbatical um it's been a heavy month and with some heavy innards a brewing uh both mentally physically emotionally And I'm taking the next few weeks to recalibrate and focus in on my own projects that need some deep focus lensing, uh, such as the Revel Ross record, the Haunt Manual print book, a new Divergent Magic Grimoire. I mean, there's so many things. And I really want to take the time to calibrate focus so you can still be privy to all my goings on at patreon.com slash pragmagic um, or we the hallowed.org i probably won't be posting on social media too much but i have been really adamant about keeping the patrons up to date on all the goings on so without further ado Please check out this wonderful chat I had with Mr. Gabriel Hart. Check out his book, On High at Red Tide. And for the love of all that is holy, on top. You've been on Pragmagic a couple of times, but the last time we chatted officially in this capacity was like five, maybe six years ago, I want to say. Yeah, was it 2019? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 2019. Yeah. I think it was like, yeah, you always kind of catch me in like really interesting like moments. Like I think (laughs) it was like, I was on there in like 2018 and then, and then after my, my first book came out in like 2019. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, And um, I mean, since then, 
there's a, there's just so much to talk about. We're not going to cover all of the, you know, the major, we'll cover the major things uh, in the past few years, but this year seems to be like a pretty bountiful kind of comeuppance for you with uh, publishing your debut novel. Um, even though, you know, as I have right here, uh, Virgins in Reverse, the twin novels, uh, which I loved. We talked about it, Virgins in Reverse and the Intrusion. Uh, Mary and I were just talking about A Return to Spring, which I also really loved. Um, and then here we are on high at Red Tide. And there's something like synchronistic about um, the setting of the time. And I think our uh, we, we share, because I went to high school, um, and what I seem is like a kind of fever dream version of the setting of this novel in a way where reading it, I knew a Mikey, I knew a Tristan, you know, I knew these characters. I don't, I know they're not probably the same, but there's something very like, you know, analogous to uh, the people in our lives during that, during kind of a 20 years ago, kind of a. Yeah, no, every town. You're right. Every town has a has a punk house, and it's and mm -hmm. I think it's um, I think when you tour a lot, you see, you know, there's something kind of reassuring. Where you see, you know, every town has that punk house. Every town has that Mikey and Tristan and stuff. It's yeah. It's you right. can't you can't escape it. It's like, yeah, yeah. Have you been kind of on? I noticed today you posted uh, your group, the Starvations. Uh, you were posting that you were going through kind of the archives. It seems like this kind of, uh, how do I put it? This uh, kind of resolve about the past and creating something new, you know, with it. And for your debut novel, I just thought it was kind of beautiful that it seems like a lot of the setting and, uh, you know, the people that you probably kind of took to conspire this was kind of a, probably around that time you were in the starvations. That, yeah, it, no, it's it's interesting. I was, I mean, I'd been working on this book for, Jesus, probably five or six years, um, right before yeah. the pandemic, I started writing it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that the whole book has had this journey, and um, which I can go on and on about. But um, yeah, th this summer, um, Dave Clifford, who was actually in the Starvations, he was in jail weddings. He's he he moved to. Germany and he yeah he's starting a record label and he's putting so he's reissuing all the all the starvations catalog and this all came up um this this year's and and yeah it's uh, um and it is interesting that it's kind of coinciding with on high at red tide because mm -hmm. yeah a lot of a lot of the subject matter that that were you know kind of covered in songs by the starvations are, are kind of covered in this in this book um it's a there's no, it's not a musical book, but it's, it's sort of, right. um, but it's a really, I think it's a good companion piece. It, it, it was an unintentional companion piece for, I think these, these reissues. It's, I, it was, um, yeah, I mean, I hadn't listened to a starvations record in probably a decade. It's a very, I mean, part, a lot of that, <laughs> a lot of that music, I just kind of, it's so, so much a part of me. I almost just don't ever need to hear it again. Um, but I forced myself to listen, to listen to it. And like with, with the novel coming out and it just brought back all these, all these memories that I hadn't thought of since, you know, they happened. So it was a really almost kind of an overwhelming, um, kind of alignment, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. It seems like a, a kind of a benevolent comeuppance of kind of, you know, the, the generations that you've been through, um, and yeah, I just thought it was interesting that it coincides. I mean, not perfectly, obviously, nothing does, but you know, with you announcing the starvations kind of mining of that archival stuff, and it was just interesting to me as as like you know, a creator or somebody that's often pondering how do I kind of assess and reinvigorate you know the past in some kind of beneficial or creative way <laughs> you know but i might yeah I mean, I, think i'm really grateful to dave clifford because i don't think this would have happened without without his urging and i you know i i think a lot of the members were, were nostalgic about that time but also it's like we're you know we're in our late i'm in my late 40s and it's so 
it's not it's difficult to to kind of go go back to that time because it's just it's yeah um, it, yeah just a, uh, i don't know how to say it without being dramatic but um yeah it's just a lot it's a lot to it's a lot to revisit and a lot it's more than just music it's it's a lot of just like um just sort of yeah there's there's just kind of like yeah there's sort of like a, a darkness there that we've been trying to <laughs> trying to um wiggle wiggle from for for decades now so it's 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 weird but i feel like yeah it's we have kind of like um some armor we yeah. we've found the armor since then to to be able to revisit it without getting too like emotional or whatever yeah it's a, it's kind of gifted now with the you know the wisdom through it but i wanted to talk about on high at red tide specifically um like the genealogy you said i did i didn't i knew you were working on something last time we you know chatted in depth about you know your past book versions in reverse and stuff and you had mentioned you know there was something you were working on but i didn't realize that it had kind of been this it had been your first novel for that long like what was the genealogy of it did you have a sort of conceit in a way of like of, of a story you knew you needed to flesh out and chip I've, been, away I mean, I've been trying to tell this story since i was a teenager i mean and it's mm. such a specific it's it's a very specific story and i feel like yeah i i knew i was going to write this book for you know probably since before virgins in reverse yeah um yeah there's just there's a lot of like you say like reconciliation i think that needed to happen with with that um you know growing up in that punk house and everything and all the all the intensity from it and um yeah, so I I started writing it in earnest, like yeah, right when the pandemic happened. I got I got injured during the pandemic, and I was kind of not bedridden, but I couldn't I couldn't really move. I was just yeah, I had to have surgery and all this stuff. So I was on disability, and I'm just like I will never. I better write this book now because I don't know when I'm ever going to get this time again. You know, so yeah. I really I just started jamming on it really really hard and. Uh, and I had done, around the time I moved out to the desert 10 years ago, I actually started interviewing a lot of people from my past. I thought it, at first it was going to, the initial book I wanted to write was going to be like a really sprawling um, account of just like punk rock in Orange County. And I knew I wanted it to have like a noir angle um, because I think Orange County is a really misunderstood place. You know, it's, it's, um, yeah even 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 the punk rock aspect of it it's it's just way different when you when you grow up there and and, it, and there is there is a cd underbelly to orange county and it's not it's not how you know the rest of the world thinks of it so i wanted to really write that version of it that i that i knew um so yeah i felt like i had to interview all these people just to really get get the whole the the landscape and just like bunch of experiences and, and filter everyone's experiences and i realized once i started writing it i'm all like oh this is this that was kind of unnecessary The the story i started writing was really 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 personal and um really specific and i think the plot the plot that kind of came it was something i was actually trying to bury and it just came the plot came screaming instead and um and you know when a plot comes screaming you know you're supposed to write it so i i um so i i wrote this it was like 400 pages it was an insane amount of work and i i was this was like in 2021 i think i i decided oh i'm done with the manuscript and i had you know, I had done a bunch of edits on it, but I was still just like one guy. I didn't have an editor at the time. And I I was spending a lot of time on Twitter and I tweeted something really silly. Like I just um, I just finished my 400 page uh, punk, totally unmarketable punk rock methamphetamine novel. Um, <laughs> and everyone everyone started, you know, chiming in going like, oh, what do you? What are you going to do with it? Are you trying to find an agent? And I, 
replied back to this guy and you know in public i tweeted back there's no way in hell any agent would have the guts to touch this thing it's too <laughs> it's too gnarly and right when i typed that 30 seconds later this agent slides into my dms this this really big agent from the trident media group in new york and he said send me that quarry immediately i'm all like what the fuck this sounds this is insane this this is almost suspicious the way this is like unfolding yeah and, and i i sent him the query i sent him the manuscript and two weeks later he calls me and he he says yeah i'm so and so i don't want to say his name just because but yeah i'm so and so from trying media group and um i want to represent you and your book i'm just like jesus this is this just sounds i couldn't i couldn't believe it and he, and it we talked and he really believed in the book and um yeah, he took off and ran with it. And I, at the time, the working title was a high prey drive, which I don't know if you know that term, but it's like the, um, it's the term for dogs when they have the urge to, to kill, you know, mm. an animal with a high prey drive. High prey. Okay. And, yeah. And he wanted to change the title. That was the only thing he wanted to change. So we've, we had this working title called the, um, the devils of blackout beach. And that's a pretty great title. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. And I thought I liked it. I mean, it was like kind of a back and forth with like, a, you know, for like a month. And, um, but yeah, I liked it. It sounded like a sixties exploitation film or something. And, the, and yeah. the novel does have some elements, um, of that in it, I, I believe. Um, so, I mean, he took off and, and ran with it and he, you know, he, he sent it to all the, 23 of like the biggest publishers out there and um it was really fascinating that whole process and you know they it's slow the rejections started coming in mm. and he was sharing them all with me all the feedback and everything and this went on for about a year and then he finally was all like shit man like i you know everyone rejected this book you're you know, I'm so sorry I did all I could. I still want to work with you and everything. Uh, you know, I want to see what your next your next manuscript and he's all you're you're welcome to do whatever you want with this with your manuscript at this point. And I read it. The blessing and the curse of being a writer is you don't know you're you don't know how much you're improving until it's too late sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I read I hadn't looked at this manuscript for about a year and I read, read it back and it was a fucking pile of garbage, like <laughs> straight up. Like I couldn't believe what I was reading. I mean, it was, it was had all the best intentions. And I think even the agent even got too excited about it. Like he, he saw the grand concept, but not the, not the, the pros, you know, the minutia. Yeah. Yeah, and I would I just couldn't believe what I was reading, and it was like, oh my god! And I was really prolific at the at the time. I mean, I was subbing. I was having really good luck, like with acceptances and and submissions and everything. I was very, yeah, my work was really getting out there. And that whole that whole year, he was shopping it around. So I, had, so I just I was mortified, and so I just really just kind of buckled down and just started rewriting it. And the more the more I start and I was relieved and it was strange because the whole time this agent had it, I was just panicking. Like it wasn't, it was exciting, but it, I was, I was stressed. Like it just seemed the way it happened. Something, it seemed like something was missing, like some step or, or something. It just seemed too. And basically what I, what I realized is that I think this guy plucked me too early he plucked me mm. and the manuscript too too early um, before it, it had fully developed. So did I he was, read I was, like a treatment or an excerpt or something, or did he just no, go I mean, he said he read the whole thing, you know, and I think wow. he never assigned me an editor or anything like that. It's mm. it's mm -hmm. still, you know, so I think he was trying to, yeah, just sell sell the concept, you know, and then we would we would edit it from there. Um but yeah and this guy this guy was like this guy had done like all this crazy stuff he did like the 
the Black Dahlia Avenger and stuff. I mean, he really knew his his shit. Um, yeah. And he, so my point is, when I was relieved to get it back because once I knew it wasn't made for that world, that that Big Five publishing world, it gave me the opportunity to like get really weird with it and nice. really really like find out who these characters were and just like be really like unself-conscious because i think even like the virgin the version i gave him i think was had the sheen on it this kind of commercial sheen that i wasn't it wasn't me you know what i mean yeah. so i spent about a year just getting really weird with the book and really really like immersing myself in each of these characters and um i ended up working with I don't know if you know who Elle Nash is. She's a really amazing writer and, and editor. And I, I worked with her. She like helped. Uh, she did some developmental edits with me. And then, then yeah, then I started shopping it around to, to independent publishers. And then it landed at Pig Roast. And it was like the best place for, for this book. I mean, he's Jeff. Jeff and Ruby like really understand, I think, the punk the punk rock thing and yeah what type, what no, type I, of book it was and what it what it was supposed to be and it, it was just the best home for it and then then they assigned me uh lisa carver to do the final edits and that was just a total thrill to work with her i was i really looked up to her growing up so um they put out her books and stuff so it was just a really yeah really fortuitous the way it all it all came together like it felt it felt very lost at sea, and then you know the, it found the perfect um, the perfect island. Yeah, what's amazing too is that it's you know not only you know something spinning in you for so long, but what 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 say like draft was it that first treatment like you know because like what I'm what I'm interested in this is that entire processes of like chipping away working with another editor helping you you know what i mean i love that that like it kind of it came out was that more of like a that first treatment that the agent got or that first draft was that more of a you just unadulterated and then from there yeah but it wasn't a good unadulterated it was like right. it was i didn't have any perspective i mean it was so i it was like that i think that that flagrant tweet i it, it, I, it was the fault of just being compulsive with like tweeting about something that you finished and it wasn't even finished. And the next thing you know, this like big agent has his hands on it. I mean, it was like, yeah, it was silly. It was a huge, mm. huge lesson. You know, the, the cautionary tale of like being, being too impatient with something, you know, yeah. a lot of writers have that problem too. They like think, yeah, they they think they just have to go 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 and you know produce and and you know it's but you you know the best books I think take take years to to develop. And yeah, yeah, that I'm was like, I think that was a that was a fatal mistake on my part. But I'm glad I'm looking back. I'm glad I had had that experience because I it just taught me a really valuable lesson. No, absolutely. I mean, it's worth it. I you know reading it there's just a there's a rhythm to it that's just unmistakable i would never have thought that it would it was something it's it has a flow to it like it it has like a linear kind of you know rhythmic vernacular it doesn't seem like at all like it's you know deeply edited there's almost like a uh, a gust to it you know this kind of like strength and i wouldn't say deeply edited but you know what i mean i i would have thought that it was a uh, very prescient kind of writing that you were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I would say, I mean, it, I think it, it re, I think what, what term did you use? It's like the wind or something. Pressing. Oh yeah. A gust. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it's, it probably reads like the gust because it is mm -hmm. very heavily edited. I mean, that's like, mm -hmm. you're not, you're not probably getting hung up on, you know, the gust isn't getting hung up on tree branches. It's like going, right. yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, I, th I would say it's a very heavily, the best edited books are the ones that don't feel like they're edited. Right. For I, sure. That makes sense, you know, that's what I was getting to in a, my long roundabout way, but uh, no, it's an absolute like achievement. And as something, you know, as uh, 
major as someone's debut novel like how are you feeling is there like a kind of reprieve at all is it just kind of down the hatch when's the next one like how are you uh, uh, well i had a really i mean i had a really the week the week before the release date i had a really yeah people you know people kept asking me like oh, are you excited about your book and people just kept asking me that i was getting so annoyed i'm all like <laughs> yeah. no, no i'm not that's not like i wrote this so i would stop being excited like excitement mm -hmm. to me is like anxiety you know and yeah. i think you you write i write to to rid myself of that i i wanted to find you know calm a calm you know i yeah, yeah. I, I, it, and but it was weird that there was all this anticipation of of it coming out for me and then i like forgot it was coming out and then the weekend before i'm just like oh shit my book is coming out next week and i was just like suddenly i just got it it just felt really like i started panicking in a in a really profound profound way where I, I kind of had this like three day panic attack. Not that I was like worried about what people would think about it or anything, but I was, I think I had lived in the book for so long and the, you know, the subject matter was so, so much a part of me that it all of a sudden felt like this like sac, um, sacrificial thing that was about to happen. And I, and it was, it felt crazy. Like, yeah, I almost didn't want it. I didn't want to let go of it. And I think that's, yeah, yeah, was, yeah was thinking about that because was crazy panic in me that I just didn't, I didn't want, <laughs> I didn't want anyone to have it. <laughs> like I, yeah. I was, I was confident about it, but I just didn't, I didn't want to let it go. Like, and yeah, it was, and it was a dark, yeah, it was a really dark week leading up to the, release date but that but um yeah i like talked to some close friends i think that would understand this kind of thing and and i by the time the release date came i i had mellowed out but yeah it was a really like psychically um yeah just yeah tough tough week and i but i think it has to, that has to do with the kind of book it is and how mm -hmm. you know close the subject matter is is to me and stuff but it wasn't. Yeah, it didn't was feel like a celebration. It didn't feel like a celebration. It felt like the end of of something. If in a in yeah, a, a sort of wake, almost. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I think about that all the time. I've you know I've got that kind of white whale of a project that I've been tending to for years and years. And I was thinking to myself the other day, like, I'm, you know, I almost. Uh, it's probably never going to come out because I need it to not come out. You know what I mean? Like I yeah, need something so to go strange. back to. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. It becomes, it, it becomes like this visceral, like physical part of you. And it feels like this massive, like surgery is, is about to, this like scary surgery is about to happen. It, it really feels yeah. like sacrificial. That's like the best, the best way I can describe it. But, but we keep doing it and it's, it's interesting that we just keep, keep doing this to ourselves and like it's, it's so it's so stupid too it's like that you were know. you know we're choosing to be in anguish about our like creative process it's like we should be so lucky you know um, yeah but i i just i think when you're like kind of bedeviled by when you're bedeviled by your your work i think it's going to have that that effect on you you know yeah, so let's talk about like uh maybe the kind of overarching uh ritual of working on it. Was it were you uh intentionally kind of spacing out or ritualizing time to work on it or was it something that you kind of just retreated to amongst the other projects you were doing that were more like immediate, say like, you know, whether it's jail weddings or say it's, you know, the last estate, you know, uh, magazine like all these projects that you had was that what you kind of went to you know 
on top of all the things that were happening? Did you formulate it was my a main, day? Yeah. I would say it was my main priority. I mean, it was like uh, it, the the time riding on it was like almost this vacuum of time that just like ceased, ceased to exist. I mean, I can't, mm -hmm. part of me can't even remember working on it in it you know uh, the yeah. the best the best work that was done on it was was the work that was done when i got the manuscript back from my agent and that was like that i'm like nostalgic for that time of it because i again i was i had the time to just get as weird as i wanted with it and i started you know i actually you want to talk about ritual yeah you know i grew, I grew up in the I grew up in the whole transcendental meditation cult. I don't know mm. if we talked about that before. I just did but I one started... of those today. <laughs> do you, wait, you do TM? Uh, just, uh, I would say like a kind or a, of a form of it. An archaic version meditation. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Not an official yeah. capacity. Um, but. I started, I started to really lean and I have very, you know, I grew up in that, in that cult. Mm -hmm. And it is a, it is a cult. Don't let anyone tell you that it's not. Um, and I was really embittered, embittered by it, but I was, and I still do it because I think meditation is really cool and beneficial. But I, when, um, when I was really trying to immerse myself in these characters again, I, I really leaned into meditation again. And I would like, I would visit, I would like visit these characters in my head and, and really hang out with them. And, and they just, it started just becoming so real in that, in that deep kind of subconscious abyss. And I, I was just spending a lot of time with these characters and I started becoming basically what happened. I thought, you know, the first version of, of the book was so autobiographical and cause I, you know, everyone thinks that they've, they, they've had the most unique life and, you know, <laughs> but when you, a funny thing happens when you write, when you take so much from real life, it, it ends up not reading well at all. It, you know, yeah. it ends up, you can't, you can't let go. You lack perspective of what's actually important and what, and what's readable, you know? And I, I think that's what happened with that first draft. And so what? so I basically looked for, I Frankensteined a lot of so one thing that L when L was doing the developmental edits with me, she's all like, You realize that there's 26 characters in this book. And I didn't I didn't realize that at the time. And so mm -hmm. I I began kind of Frankensteining these characters together. I I cut it in half, I got it down to 12 characters, and I was looking more for like archetypes rather than people people that yeah. I knew. Um, I wanted, I wanted the reader, even if they didn't grow up in that kind of debauchery, I wanted them to rec at least recognize feelings rather than characters. And so these, these characters kind of embody these, these kind of universal, um, feelings, I guess. But yeah, so I, to, to speak to ritual, yeah, the, this meditation and, you know, you're not, they say you're not supposed to act on any creative ideas you have when you meditate because it's going to be too abstract or whatever but i really leaned Oops. into that I, yeah. I i got i just got i developed these really intimate relationships with these characters for better or worse yeah in that kind of imaginarium way mm -hmm. um yeah i see i i totally get that i love this idea of kind of the amalgamation of of characters and kind of combining them for archetypal stuff. I think of like, you know, the suits in the tarot or whatever, like the, you know, even the Myers Briggs personality types I've used before as like a way to kind of objectively get to know a character fictionally, like put them through these like really kind of arbitrary, but silly kind of personality tests and stuff. And right. Uh, yeah. I that's just, a really good yeah. way to put it. Yeah, I love. Uh, so, how, like, what did you find? I love that you said you you went for feeling more than for you know anything else when it came to characters. So, when I'm thinking of certain characters from the book in my mind, like I I know exactly what you're talking about because there's there's some that have contrasting elements, 
but they're it's like they're tethered with uh, humor or they're like they're you know what I mean they're not so outlandishly contrasted if that makes sense yeah and there yeah. yeah I've been told that it's a very humorous book too and I I never that's something that for, always comes up afterwards yeah. with me like I never set out yeah. to even make something have like black humor to it it's just right right I'm always kind of shocked when someone says my work is funny but I think that that's I think something happens once you know things when things become like when the poetry ends and things just become so deliberate it becomes mm -hmm. really humorous you know when when the artifice of it just um drops it the the frankness of it can be really yeah. humorous matter of factness of it there is yes. a very direct um almost journalistic quality to it which you know knowing that you're you're pulling from your own experiences and stuff and this is something i'm just personally like really investigating within my own stuff is like how how that formulation like how that resolve kind of happens when you can let go of a memory being exact or like you know what i mean you can like you can let it breed into other things or combining them into stuff because it's i don't know if you feel this but as as i get older i almost feel like uh more you know um hard nosed about memory and in the mm -hmm. past you know it's like yeah as a crutch almost <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i mean you mentioned the journalistic angle I, a big inspiration mm -hmm. for for this book the very first book i read during the pandemic was um the executioner song by norman mailer oh yeah about, about gary gilmore it's like the thousand page um epic about gary gilmore and it's written in that really cold um almost like Truman Capote, like journal journalistic mm -hmm. style. Um, and I want, I really wanted it to have that tone. Um, so, and I, yeah, it does. When, I, when I did the rewrite, I kind of changed, you know, I changed that, that voice a little bit, but I think a lot of that still maybe remains in that, in the book. So it's, it's sort of a, a juxtaposition of, um, yeah, there's an undercurrent like, there, but there's sort still of a gonzo, gonzo style, yeah. and also kind of like a very cold, um, yeah, yeah, very cold journalistic style. And I get like that's maybe where the humor comes in, as you were saying. And it's also like I find the humor because I'm sharing almost in um, correlative memory in a way, and it's almost like an uncomfortable kind of humor. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like. Uh, well, yeah. that's why you laugh because you're nervous. You know, it's like a right. nervous. I think, exactly. I think, yeah, the yeah. best, the best. If you're not laughing for pure joy, you're laughing because something's making you incredibly nervous and you don't know what else to do. So, yeah, I, I, yeah. I could see, I could see a lot of those lines maybe inducing, inducing that nervous. Well, how has uh, you know you hit, you left LA or you left Southern California, you hit the desert. You're what five, six six or seven years on now and uh, oh i'm like almost a decade out here a now. decade yeah 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 it's crazy yeah i i can't i have to remind myself how long how long it's been it's um yeah yeah it seems like you really almost... found your atmosphere there like you, there was a calling you know i'm feeling that too of a getting out of the city sort of you know like uh omnipresent kind of ick about yeah. um yeah about this sort of thing yeah i mean i couldn't i couldn't imagine living in a, any city ever again really i mean this is yeah it's not without its challenges out here but yeah i mean i i feel i don't think there's any turning back it, it's it's too you become part of the landscape out here in ways that you intended and and also never were never prepared for and it's yeah you yeah, I'm. I'm. I love it out here. I mean, I yeah. I say this all the time, but if I'm ever in a bad mood, I just walk outside of my house and I like instantly reminded where where I am and that you know that my problems are are petty at best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a bit of man versus nature, like a yeah. kind of communion, you know, in that in that heat and in that arid 
atmosphere. But at the same time, it seems like, um, you know, was it Space Cowboy? Like, it seems like there's a lot of literary and musical uh, communion down there, too. Like, there's a... There's Definitely, a yeah. It's... Yeah. We just had, yeah, they just had the Tornado Palms Book Festival, the second right. annual Tornado Palms Book Festival, and that was, like, twice as big as last year, and that was, that's been a real real kind of boon to the literary scene and yet yeah, uh space cowboy books is still still holding strong um yeah there it's it's all kinds of i mean it also that it's changing so much up here too i mean it's changed so much in the last 10 years um for the better and a lot for for the worse it's it's there's so it's it's interesting because there's so so many people are moving out here, which I couldn't, you know, mm. I I knew that was going to happen, you know, but yeah, um, it's also such a transient place because it's a, it's a tourist, it's a high area of high tourism. So there's this level of transience where you can't, it's, it's kind of hard to get close to people because you don't know how long they're going to be around. You don't know what their intentions are even for being here. Right. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of like opportunists here that that are trying to just like um, make money up here and run whether it's the, like the whole Airbnb thing or or just start there's like yeah the, the thing about the desert too there's like there's an element of like the grifter up here these people that just show up and you have to think like why are they here like did they and you realize a lot of these people are grifters where and they where they burned bridges from wherever else they were from and there's nowhere else they can go. They could have yeah. gone and so end up here. There's so you really have to have your wits about you when you when you just meet people here because you just don't you don't know what their intentions are. I guess you could say the same thing as like meeting someone in the city, but it's just it's different here. It's it's yeah, um, for sure. Your people people are so yeah, people um, can be very, very obvious up here without without uh, realizing it, and also yeah. and also very, very deceiving as well. How was that like inform? I mean, like, yeah, what is what is kind of a Morongo Valley day for you with when it comes to you know you balancing, you know, the writing and the music? Um, I, I'm not sure if outside of the starvations like kind of archival stuff is there a jail weddings on the horizon are you yeah yeah I've been, music out there yeah we've i've been going back to la um this year like not as much as i'd like to but yeah we have we're like working on a new record and awesome. it's it's kind of just me and the boys right right now um okay just trying to flesh out flesh out the songs and i think we're going to call on everyone else when the time is right just not to waste everyone's time um, but yeah, it's, that's going slower than, than I would like it to, but, um, yeah, I think writing has just become so much a part of my life. I mean, I'm writing literally all day, whether I'm doing radio stuff or fiction or, or, um, yeah. you know, other, other projects. So I've definitely turned into more of like a, my priorities have changed a little bit. Writing, writing's just more of a, an immediate thing I can just do do without. Yeah, even thinking and uh, music, music takes major effort. I think, and it's yeah, it's tough. And other people, to some degree, you know, I'm with you. There's yeah. like, yeah, I definitely feel like I'm getting into the season where, like, I I, I don't know if you've seen these uh, Alpha Smart Neos. They're like, no, I have no um, idea what that is. They're from 2000, like the early 2000s, and it's basically just a word processor. It's like this. Oh, big. I think I saw. I yeah, I think I saw you post post a photo. Yeah, of those. <laughs> yeah, and like that's been to me. That's been my reprieve. That you know, I slap it in a bag. My phone's not coming out. Like anywhere yeah. I go, it, it just writing just seems to be like the end all be all of just pure. You know, I don't know like a uh, creation really without mm -hmm. a lot of tools that of course is like a tool, but um, just meaning that, you know, yeah, I, I definitely feel that I don't, more of like an era instead of a season, you know, of just yeah 
you know, that kind of hushed uh, self-reliance about, you know, creating, not needing much to do so, you know? Yeah, exa exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there was a while, there was a while during the pandemic where I was even like really bitter towards music and just like, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, all these social upheavals were happening during 2020 and I'm just like, God, I, I wish... I just want to watch the whole music industry just burn to the ground too. Like, you know, it yeah. just seemed like ripe and ready for that to happen as, as corrupt as it's always been. And I think I, I think I was just burnt out too. And I think it was tough watching the world burn and, and to be, and to, and to think, uh, you know, and to even consider being like a white guy strutting around on, on a stage again, you know, it just seemed yeah. totally all of a sudden completely um, just trite. So I think, yeah, no, I I've had a, I've had a huge crisis of faith um, with, with the whole thing, but I, but I also just don't, you know, I think it's sort of silly to throw, throw out the baby with the bathwater. And I think yeah. singing, singing is really important to me. And I think it's really uh, you know, singing makes me feel better. I think it's, it's something, I think the vibrations that happen when you, when someone sings, when, when you allow yourself to sing, it's, it could be just a really healing and, and very necessary thing to, to do. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I realize I, I shouldn't, um, you know, let go of that part of a part of me either. Well, yeah, that's good to hear, but I, I totally understand where you're coming from. And especially that needing that kind of somatic exorcism of singing and, you know, even playing something rhythmically. There's, yeah, there's just, there's just something to it that's uncanny, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I wanted to talk about Beyond the Last Estate, um, which I don't have with me in the room, but I'm a proud owner of the first issue and really excited about it, too. Thank you, too, thank you again for copying one too i appreciate it of course yeah yeah um i i love it i feel like uh you know it's kind of to tether it to the 2020 isms of just kind of the the death of how things are delivered media wise you, you know and it's not regression but it's almost yeah it's more of like a dance with the things that we loved and like what made us excited about writing or, or music and it's it's always going to be like these print you know things and i just i love that you yeah you uh you're editing the uh this this magazine basically and there's what, what would you call it a rag obviously but it's it's very it's like the magazine size and the format but it's mm -hmm. uh yeah it, it's awesome lots of beautiful writing um yeah it's yeah cool. we, like what what I, What's up? I was just going to ask. Yeah, what uh, what was the you know the creation myth on that one? The, um, so beyond the last estate, start, I mean, there was a website called the Last Estate that me and um, my a collective uh, group of friends and I started in twenty twenty one. Yeah, twenty twenty one, like, and it lasted from twenty twenty one to twenty twenty three. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of my writer friends that kind of grew out of this Friday night writing group called uh, Misery Loves Company that came oh, yeah. from this website called uh, Misery Tourism. And uh, yeah, we just, uh, William William, and Rudy who run Misery Loves Company just got uh, called on me and um, my friend Derek Main and Jesse Hilson and... Um, maybe like four or five other people sort of a revolving cast to start this website of um, what we were calling creative reporting on literature and the arts. And yeah, it was, it was so uh, the, the, um, the guise of the website is that we all live together in this dilapidated um, Southern, Southern plantation mansion Mm -hmm. this kind of post-apocalyptic thing. And it was all of us living together, uh, reporting on uh, the corpse of culture, I guess, was yeah. what we were saying. So, yeah, it was a really, it was a really fruitful time. And um, yeah, it lasted for a couple of years. And I, th I think, you know, 
all good things have have to end and it was it was the perfect time to end it and i and we were just like what's what's next and i i just kept like rudy rudy his aesthetic was just so beautiful and um you know lots of neon and lots of like ghosts and hey. uh, secret yeah. secret <laughs> passages in the in this mansion That's he created awesome. and, and i was just like god it would be so cool to make a coffee table book out of this and then i'm all like no that'd be too expensive and then I, but I couldn't stop thinking about like there needs to be, you know, this whole, this whole literature, indie literature scene is so online based, and it seems so disposable. There needs to be like a print headquarters yeah. for all this stuff to to kind of help. I don't want to say like legitimize it, but something something to look forward to, and maybe something to just get people's eyes off the screen. Absolutely. And I, yeah. and I, so I told, I, I was working for lit reactor. I was um, contributing to them every month and they folded. And I was like, God, I really miss, you know, writing about writing and, you know, interviewing authors. And it became so much a part of me. And I was, I, not only was I bummed to see lit reactor go, which was, they were such an institution to so many people, but I just missed the act of, writing about writing and writing about writers and book yeah. reviews and all that stuff. So yeah, I just, I uh, used, yeah, kind of the, you know, the death of that venue is like, okay, something, something else just needs to happen. And, and if no one else is, isn't going to do it, I'm just going to do something. So I, um, yeah. yeah, taught myself in design and really challenging, but yeah, now it's like kind of a piece of cake and, um, right. Since you, know, you have the template, it's, yeah, and I'm, uh, I have the yeah a whole slew of contributors, and everyone's getting along really well and delivering really, really amazing stuff. And I can, yeah, I couldn't be happier. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I love it. It's uh, it's definitely something that uh, I just felt very synchronous to, like what we were doing, kind of in our collective that was an online blog thing that was in person, and then pandemic happened, then became this online kind of free for all and the emptiness that we were kind of left with, you know, after that of, yeah, it, a lot of it does. And I don't mean to sound like, you know, Steve Albini about it, but, or like, you know, a super analog nerd, you know, about it, but like, there is just a tactile kind of, yeah, the, just print, you know, I think, it's uh it's it was it's in my family too my uh grandparents owned a ribbon business and would do like small press you know printing uh, mm -hmm. hot press and old ludlow machines and yeah it's just something there that i just feel like anytime i release an album or you know i, I post an article somewhere it just feels like it just vanishes into this like amorphous yeah. digital ether and you know yeah, yeah, I, with blue light. <laughs> you know? I totally, I totally agree. There's a huge misconception that the internet is forever. It's totally not. There's like so many great pieces of writing that have just disappeared from the internet and with no yeah. accountability. And like, yeah, the I, you know, print is isn't the most cost effective option, yeah. but it is, you know, it is forever as long as like your house doesn't burn down. You know, right. It's, yeah, and there's a sense of ownership about that too, of how you take care of something, you know, that totally. you procure. And like, yeah, I love that. I love this all these like unspoken, like, uh, you know, com like uh, communions with the different aspects of that, of mailing it, of, you know, packaging it, of uh, receiving it, of, of reading it, of earmarking it, you know. It's just, and, uh, it's, it's sad that, you know, that needs to to be addressed or, or maybe not sad but i do i do catch myself being a little pompous about it or like silly about you know That's just okay. how kind of unremarkable it is but it's like really remarkable to me just because that's it's been so missing or people haven't really put it in the you know the forefront like um you know i think we used to and so yeah when the and I love Misery Tourism. I've seen a couple of their um, like writer shares 
on YouTube and uh or misery loves company um and yeah it was just uh it's just great i'm just happy that there's like places of anarchic weirdos making cool shit you know yeah no agreed and the thing <laughs> the thing too about print i mean my my biggest concern and i know a lot of people share this point of view too the the thing with like internet writing is like it's cool yeah because it's so immediate and you know, you'll often get work accepted that'll end up on a site, you know, the next day or the next week, but rarely is that stuff edited by, you know, Oh yeah. By the people on the masthead of those, those online journals. And it's like, everyone is so impatient for self validation and stuff. And they're just so, you know, the, they just want that dopamine hit of like their work being, being out there and yeah so when when something is in print like whether it's your book or you know i yeah i basically i think yeah print magazines are important because people are hopefully actually editing the the work that you're yeah that you're, that that's you're something reading. I, need. I think there's something there's something a little more intimidating and glaring when you see mistakes or imperfections in in something you know that's that's laid out in something that's that people are going to be holding in their hands, you know, that yeah, that does, does seem a little more, more permanent, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's yeah, a, there's the, a lot of, there's a lot more care I've seen with uh, contributors um, giving me work for beyond the last estate than I think, you know, it, it, than it would have been if it was like an online journal. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, they, and it's, and I, it's yeah, a lot like too. And there's like a, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're a lot more open to me actually helping edit their work and stuff. So, well, and that's brilliant because yeah, I think, you know, and we, we kind of learned self publishing as a collective and it, it's one thing to have the tit for tat. Like, I, I think this looks good. Um, especially for people that wear a bunch of hats like in that setting, but it's another to have a, you know, the focused mind of editing and, and, and really like correlating to how this is going to flow with everything. And I think that's like where we got spoiled, I think with online things and I'm finding with our, like moving to print is that we almost in a kind of like anarchic way or like no keep the typos in like fuck them like you know what i mean like everything's pristine now there's no uh you know there's no uh grammarly with this you know <laughs> like that and it's it can go so much the opposite way that it ruins the kind of you know flow so we're yeah we're finding our footing and and just uh yeah taking taking more consideration like it it really does come down to intent you know and yeah uh, Definitely. Yeah. You don't want to sell yourself short. Like if you're, if you're so into like producing, you know, work, why would you, why would you, yeah. It, it, people just need to slow down. I think, I think that's yeah. the biggest, there's, there's this big pressure on being prolific because, you know, hmm. and it's like the chicken or the egg. It's like, are people being like what happened first, like people's low attention spans or people feeling the need to be super prolific to, to cater to the short attention spans, you know, it's absolutely, yeah. we have to just completely, I think, pull back. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Uh, it's a hard thing to unlearn too. I think, you know, there's, it's a, it's a spoil culture of sorts of, especially when it's about, kind of a validation of how many eyes you know get to yeah. see this thing or how many how many people you're reaching like i went through i don't know how you feel about i mean just kind of streaming at large but like i took down you know i took off a bunch of my albums from streaming a year ago and i've just kind of piecemealed like tested maybe a song here or there or whatever just to let it languish in kind of a you know goodbye mode and i feel that's like that's just kind of where we at with the internet it almost makes more sense to be deeply intentful and like tactile with what you're creating and finding to find the right people i mean you know. yeah i agree i mean and again i my 
I'm so grateful for Dave Clifford for doing these reissues because I would have yeah, never yeah. done that on my own because I don't give it, I don't have Spotify or anything like that. I mean, it, you know, fine. If people use Spotify, it's great that those songs are going to be on there, but I, I wouldn't have given a shit <laughs> otherwise. So yeah, it's great. Sure. Someone's, someone's uh, doing that. Yeah. I don't, and I'm not, yeah, I'm not like a Steve Albini guy either. I'm not like a super, you know, a analog fiend either but but i'm like i never i just never i rarely listen to digital music it just doesn't even occur to me I, i'm not anti-digital music i just does it's it's not even like an instinct of mine yeah no that makes perfect sense uh what uh so you went on a book tour a little bit after red tide came out how did that go it sounded like it it was awesome it was really, yeah, it was really great. It was, um, you know, these things are always such a gamble. You, you know, you mm -hmm. buy a, you buy a plane ticket and fly across the country, you know, for some readings and you, you know, it's almost presumptuous in a way, like thinking that anyone's going to show up, but it was, um, no, it was really great that, you know, pig, pig roast, Jeff from pig roast met me in, in Brooklyn and he had set up these readings for us. He set up a reading in Manhattan for us at the KGB bar, which was a yeah, oh, yeah. very well well established old literary bar. It's been there for decades. Um, yeah, New York is very. It's funny. I've I was there in twenty twenty one for for a reading, and I've I I feel like New York is yeah. It was like the first time New York was really making sense to me, and I the first time I really realized like wow this city as big as it is it's very supportive of of this kind of thing hmm. and yeah i mean I, I it was it was great like at seven o'clock the bar was packed with people and i it couldn't have been a better a better reception um yeah all yeah. the all the readers were were great i got to meet uh daniel chelosky who's yeah become a great friend since since the um the reading and um yeah and it you know we sold we sold a fair amount of books and stuff but that these things aren't really actually about selling books it's about you know um it's a it's actually about meeting people it's about testing the relationships of these people you only you previously only knew from the internet you know sure yeah and and tempering tempering these relationships to make sure they're that they're real you know yeah and yeah so for that it was really reassuring and it felt like yeah there was a lot of camaraderie and after yeah the next day we me and jeff and uh cletus crow this really great poet on pig roast we and then uh another great poet morgan reed um drove down to philadelphia and we read at uh this place called tattooed mom this kind of punk bar multi-level okay. punk bar um and yeah, that was like five days of just really <coughs> great revelry and yeah, couldn't have asked for a better trip. I loved, uh, you know, uh, you invited me back at, what was it? Mother Foucault's in like 2018. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was great. Um, yeah. And like, there's something that stays with me still about, um, just reading, um, that kind of vulnerability. I was nervous as all hell because I don't, I didn't have anything to hide behind. You know, I didn't have mm -hmm. guitar or, you know, whatever instruments or, you know. Oh yeah. Your first, your, was that your first time reading? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It, it's terrifying the first time you do it <laughs> for, for those exact reasons. It's, but it's you like, start, it's you start finding typos in your, you know, yep. your, I think a writer should always read their stuff out loud. Yeah in the, in the editing process, because that's, that's just huge. I mean, you get, you get all, all senses that way. I agree. But yeah, that was like, like the first public and uh, it, it haunts me because I felt really, there was a fulfillment I had like had was not getting from music or performing, you know, mm -hmm. around that you're, time. You were great. I would have, yeah. I, I remember you being, being near perfect. Oh, thanks. Uh, I remember Mary telling me uh, about a twitch I had where I was like kind of clasping my arm, you know, those little things of <laughs> Oh yeah, we all have we all have our one our one, you know, major tick. 
Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think the live reading too is just something I I don't know. I feel kind of at, at sea out here in this large city, but that sort of community based, you know, thing of getting back to reading prose, um, you know, in public or at bars or cafes or bookstores. It's like, yeah, it just, uh, it was something really um, fulfilling when I did it. So thank you for inviting me to do that back when. And it's something that I've, I've had in the back of my mind is I want to keep trying or like keep pursuing that, you know? Yeah, no, I think it's really, I think it's really important. Yeah. Just the, the immediacy and, and, you know, to take it, to take it to an, to another level, like, you know, hopefully, you know, so it's not a bunch of people just like reciting their work and like poet voices and stuff, which is, sure. can be really a, a bit much, you know, it's, we should treat it. I feel like, yeah, we should treat it like a performance and, you know, their a sense of, you know, breathy urgency maybe you know mm -hmm. or else why why else would you why else would you care absolutely so what's on the docket uh i know you've got another beyond the last estate issue coming out oh your uh your radio show uh which i wanted to hear more about if you have a little time just uh you're kind of like on air reporting yeah yeah, and I don't. It's not a radio show. I'm just. I'm a. I'm a news reporter. It's yeah. Oh, like okay. My beat, oh, damn. My beat is. Uh, my beat is the Morongo Valley. Um, yeah, I mean, I. It's. What's great about Z1077? It's. It's. They've been non corporate. I think since '87. Um, but it's feel. You know, you go in there and it's like this bustling. Old school radio environment. Bullpen. And I just kind of, I, What's yeah. up? Bullpen and like yeah yeah the, yeah. yeah really That's awesome. high energy high energy but but no bullshit you know it's like mm -hmm. it feels kind of familial and um yeah kind of a throw it feels like there's like a a, a bit of a pipeline to the to the past yeah um, but yeah they, it's yeah um yeah I'm really grateful for it though they they let me kind of pitch whatever I want I mean I could do. I'll do stuff from like school meetings to like a little bit of crime to like, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of, lot of like literary stuff. I'm usually like the guy that will report on like literary stuff happening in the, in town or, you know, visiting authors and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I have, a, I have a pretty, uh, yeah, pretty wide scope. That's amazing. Um, talk about community oriented too. That's, uh, that's yeah. lovely. And it doesn't, you know, it's, hard work we all do there but it doesn't feel like work because it's writing right. and it's like you're it's like kind of it's service yeah i'd be doing i'd be doing it anyway at home you know nice yeah well i know you said you were working on some new jail weddings that'll come when it comes but uh yeah what's what's uh 2025 shaping up for you like um i i've been I've been, I really want to revisit this other novel manuscript I, I had. I started writing a novel when I moved out here and it's, um, it's just been this thing that's gnawing at me. It's sort of like a, a desert noir, but also like a, um, do domestic kind of, um, dystopian, uh, God, what would you call it? Yeah. It's like revolutionary road. Um, who's afraid in, of Virginia Wolf? Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, again, I, I need to, I haven't looked at, um, I, the, my, my dear friend who was beta reading it, um, Pat passed away two years ago. And I'm just like, it's, it's just haunting me to like even open that document again. Cause it just makes me sad. Cause she was like the last one to be looking at it so I need to just like I need to just kind of get um get over myself and just realize that it's a that it's just a piece of writing and, and get back into it um so yeah I think that'll be that'll be something I'm I'll be focusing on next year and then yeah I have a and are short you, story. Oh, I'm yeah sorry, you're not very deadline like heavy you're kind of no nah. you're gonna just work on it until it's 
till it's ready right yeah i don't know why people do that to themselves deadlines yeah. like why <laughs> why what is the what is the rush like why do why do people i mean we're not like we're not getting paid for this why why would you put a deadline right. for, you know who are you trying <laughs> who, are you, no. who are you trying to be on time for you know yeah i you don't know how much i needed to hear that actually it's good to, i mean it's good to set goals you know if we didn't set goals sure. we would just be spinning our wheels our, our whole lives but deadlines are you kidding me like get out of here yeah <laughs> save that for the newsroom yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> well thanks so much man is there anything else uh you wanted to mention or any kind of um you know i'll get all of your pertinent links and all that stuff uh sorted and whatnot but uh, just want to give you some time for the floor if you had anything that you wanted to yeah, blast um, out. Just, yeah, you can get uh, my novel on High Red Tide from pigrosepublishing.com. Uh, we prefer that you order straight from the publisher for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, um, you can order Beyond the Last, the new issue Beyond the Last Estate, issue two with David Kunlin on the cover. Is there a coon line? God, I hope I didn't butcher his name. Um, you just you contact uh, beyond the last estate at gmail.com and I will give you the ordering information. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's about it. I'm I'm around. So as, beyond uh, the last. Oh, sorry, not to interrupt, but uh, there's yeah. uh, beyond the last estate. Are, do you take submissions at all, or are you? We do, I, I don't want it to turn into like a, a slush pile sure. situation. Um, I usually, I'll take, I'll take, I take pitches. Um, yeah, take, yeah, I encourage people to, to write to that, that, um, that email address and, and pitch me, pitch me stuff. I could only take like five to six long form contributors an issue. And that, that tends to fill up kind of quick, but I'm always taking, um, as many hundred word book reviews as people can dish out that's turned into a really, um, actually like potent format that, you know, people, yeah. people seem to be really stoked on and it's, it's garnering a lot of interest for these books and, um, just, a, mm -hmm. it's a, yeah, it ends up being a quick way to get the word out. And I don't, with these small reviews, I don't like them to be synopsis of the book. I want them to be like a poetic exchange. Yeah, uh, sure. you know, I, love I want that. I want these little, I want these reviews to be like little jewels in them in themselves, you know. Yeah, interpretive, you know. I love it. Yeah, it's a it's a great work. Um, it's awesome. You're hitting, not only you know the long form narrative novel, the solo work, but the communal work with Beyond the Last Estate, and you know, of course, all the music and everything. And hey, man, your uh, congratulations. I'll just say that. You know. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I do my due diligence to shed some light on a bunch of the wonderful totemic artifacts that we are creating across many a medium from our collective Be the Hallowed to me personally. Um, one major talismanic journal is my publication of the Divergent Magical Grimoire. Um, anyone can use it. It is magician operational. It is paradigm operational. There's no distinct current. It is a schema uh, for you to log, create, construct, deconstruct, hell, even ruin the rituals that make your art, that make your day, that make your communion to the other. So you can check this out, as well as t-shirts and fun ephemera from We the Hollywood Artist Eric J. Millar, or me, like Dakota Slim, uh, Rebel Ross, who I just released a new song sigil that I'll be releasing every few weeks or so. That is also accompanied with a videomantic visualizer, and that'll all build into the debut first highly produced full-length album. Here you know about the Frag Magic podcast or the YouTube channel, and I really, really appreciate you stopping by, giving us some you know, tricky old demonic engagement in these digital rhythms. But a like, a share, a subscribe, all of that tit-for-tat kind of clickety-clack really goes a long way to help support a bunch of magical ephemera of all sorts. So help support the DIY human error punks in fighting this ridiculous, absurd, new high-tech era with some high-touch magics. Thanks for stopping by. Patreon.com slash Pride Magic. All done.